But unfortunately, it'll never happen. Crunch! Punches! And punches! And it's over! I think it's gonna be over. Aguero in big trouble against the ropes! I have to say, there seems an element of genuine hate between these two, Ambrose. For sure. I don't hate the man. Just imagine if you bought a ticket. Stop it, Frank. You can stop it any time. Castillo's in trouble. Leak steps in. And the fight is over. Oh! Welcome back to the Legendary Knights podcast, season three, episode number nine, the tale of Willie Pep and Sandy Sadler. Really excited to be bringing this episode to you guys, another historical episode, and it's been a season of historical episodes, but we feel like what we've done for you is bring you stories that are amazing tales that have since been forgotten about because it was so long ago. And we feel like delivering these to the audience, as in yourselves and everybody else that listens to us, you're actually getting a feel and an understanding, much like we do when putting them together, as to how things were at the time and how these roads between these fighters intertwine, the stories that surround them, build up aftermaths, fights themselves. And we've got another brilliant one in Willie Pep and Sandy Sadler. Really excited to be talking about this fight and describing the stories and the fights and everything that surrounded it. Yes, and uh, this is one of the greatest rivalries in boxing history, without a shadow of a doubt. It's up there with all the top rivalries you can ever think of. Willie Pep and Sandy Sadler. But Willie Pep is arguably the greatest featherweight of all time. Sandy Sadler's got something to say about that. But if not of all time, many people have him very highly as the greatest ever fighter. And when you hear that the numbers... It's difficult to argue that, but it's one thing we, we wanted to do with this is Sandy Sadler. Sandy Sadler is a guy that gets completely overlooked. When people think of Willie Pep, they think of Sandy Sadler, but when they think of, you know, it, Willie Pep is out on his own. As I say, you know, he, he features so highly in many people's greatest ever fighters, and Sandy just doesn't. He was a tremendous fighter. You know, Sandy Sadler was the benchmark for the likes of Alexis Arguello, Tommy Hearns, and Bob Foster. This guy was sublime and uh, when we give you his numbers too you'll be shocked so we want to be able to bring to light just how good he was too so as always we will go into a little bit of a background onto both fighters because it's two fighters we've never covered before of course there'll always be a career profile coming at some point in the future so we wanted to bring some stories from both sides and also talk about a few of the most notable fights and then of course their contest that they shared the ring together so we're going to start first and foremost with willie pep now his real name was willie guaglermo papaleo but we all know him as Willie Pep, and he was born in Middletown, Connecticut, and was the son of Italian immigrants. Now, as I've said, we will get to do a career profile on the legendary Willie Pep, so we're going to jump on and, and vaguely cover his amateur career, where he won 53 fights before he was finally defeated. That defeat came in 1938, the same year Pep changed his name against none other than Sugar Ray Robinson, then fighting a featherweight. After the fight, Robinson and his trainer, George Gainford, got arrested by a Hartford policeman claiming that no amateur could beat Willie Pep, so he must be professional. They were later released once an AAU boxing representative from New York vouched for them. Pep recalled, At the time, I had a manager from Hartford. He was the bravest manager in the world. He didn't care who I fought. He put me in with a fellow that was £20 more. If I weighed the same amount, Maybe I couldn't beat Ray. I had no business being in the same ring with Ray that night. He was a great amateur fighter. Indeed, Ray was a great amateur fighter, but so was Pep, who finished with a record of 62 wins out of 65 fights. And along the way, he won the Connecticut State Amateur Flyweight Championship in 1938 and then repeated the feat in the bantamweight division a year later. Pep turned professional in 1940 and like an unstoppable jet train, he marched his way through the featherweight division with ease, making the boxing world stand up and take notice of this great young fighter that journalists said had the golden boy touch. Well, Pep actually recalled that I boxed amateur. I won 15 or 20 in a row. 
And finally, I didn't have to worry about going work anymore. I made boxing my business. In early 1942, Pep was actually spotted by a trainer called Bill Gore, who owned a gym in Miami. Um, Stanley Frank wrote in uh, Colliers that one glance told Gore that Willie knew everything about the fine science of modified murder, and he had to be built up physically to improve his pinch and stamina. Pep was complimentary of his new trainer, saying that I've got to give a lot of credit to my trainer, Bill Gore. He was pretty good for me. He was strictly a boxer's trainer. And me being a boxer, he fitted right with me. I had the speed to burn and I didn't know how to use it. Bill showed me how to use the hand speed and how to box. This is very important to have a good trainer like that. The combination of Gore and Pep was the perfect formula as together they picked up stand-up victories that included Johnny Compo and top 10 contenders Pedro Hernandez and Bobby Poison Ivy. In March 1942, Pep collected his first major title when he beat Compo for the New England featherweight strap. Pep recalled his dramatic rise and he said, I boxed everyone that was around. I boxed Bobby Poison Ivy, a local boy from Hartford, who was a pretty damn good fighter. I boxed Pedro Hernandez who was a number one challenger. That's how I got my shot with Chalky Wright. I was matched with Chalky Wright on November the 20th, 1942. And by the time Pep was only 21, he had skyrocketed himself into a world title fight just two years after he actually turned professional. His popularity was soaring by the time he met the New York State Athletic Commission or the NYA. SAC featherweight champion Chalky Wright at Madison Square Garden. A Collier's article described Pep's attraction and it read, For an understanding of Willie's extensive popularity in his home state, note must be made of an aberration peculiar only to Hartford and the surrounding countryside. Most localities are interested only in heavyweights. The muscular meatballs who can knock the other guy dead with a punch. But Connecticut is crazy about featherweights. The promoters, well aware that the people come to see Willie Box, have been forced to change their programmes. Instead of going on in the fifth bout at 10pm, the feature spot for the headliner, Willie's Fight, always is the third event at 9.15pm to permit the war workers on the night shift to report for duty at 11 o'clock. There were two featherweight champions at this point. Wright, called the New York version, considered the most prestigious, and Jackie Wilson was the National Boxing Association, otherwise known as the NBA, champion. There was some dispute as to who the real title holder was, but most considered Wright the king of the feathers, a guy who had fought over 200 fights and knocked out half of them, and Pep, the number one contender. The fight was described as the soaring young star versus the ageless boxing sage and youth versus experience. The Lewiston Daily Sun reported on the fight, scoring the 54th straight triumph in his unbeaten run as a fighter, Pep piled up a big early lead with the use of a left jab that appeared to have a permanent parking place in Chalky's face and then galloped out of harm's way as the ageing California Negro chased him around the ring all the way down the stretch. Aided and abetted by thousands of Connecticut fans who came down to root their hero home, the turnout soared to new records for a featherweight championship bout with 19,521 customers paying to sit in on the fuss. Now Pep was normally the aggressor in fights but instead of rushing in he was actually ordered to dance and retreat use his left jab and never allow right to get set to throw his right hand during the fight pep did as he was told successfully but hated the strategy and in a later round he actually asked gore can i punch him now gore said if he deviated from that plan he would be crowned with the water bucket the continued report from the Lewiston Daily Sun explained that the fight was a slow battle most of the way. Pep got on his bicycle to come home with the crown, while Chalky's inability to corner the slippery willy meant Pep took nine rounds on the Associated Press scorecard and six went to right, who was the aggressor for a large part of the evening, but just couldn't seem to solve Willie's 
jabs and shift tactics. Pep might not have been overly happy with Gore's tactics, but he understood the importance of it. And this is what he said. He said, I was at boxing him. I make him miss quite a few punches. And this is the idea of the game, hit and not get hit. And that's exactly what happened. I made him look foolish, I guess, at times because he was missing me all over the ring. But this is the idea, not to get hit. And I won the championship. It's the science of the game. That's what they say. He also knew how vicious Wright was. And he actually told this or explained this in this corner. He said that Chalky was the hardest puncher that the featherweight division had had in the past 20 or 30 years. He could get you with one punch. All he had to do was get you on the chin with one punch and he'd knock you out. He boxed welterweights. He was such a tremendous puncher that put him in with anybody. But Pep demonstrated why they called him Willow the Wisp in this fight, showing his ability to move and faint with effortless ease while evading powerful punches. Willie Pep was now officially one of the biggest stars in boxing at the age of just 20. He was showing maturity beyond his years and had a following that no promoter in the right minds would turn their nose apart. Jim Shea of Sports Illustrated explained the heights that he had got to and he said Pep danced in the spotlight and the world cheered. He had drinks with Frank Sinatra, dined at Toot Shores, wintered in Florida and beat everyone his handlers put in front of him. He fought eight more times after winning the World Featherweight title and took his career record to 62-0. That was until March the 19th, 1943 at Madison Square Garden. Pep stepped up in weight for a non-title fight against the returning Sammy Angnott, who was 69-17-5, who had retired as the undisputed world lightweight champion due to a broken right hand. Some stories suggest that Angnott was forced to retire because he refused to do business with the mob, but he and his manager strongly denied those rumours. It's to no surprise that Uncle Mike Jacobs promoted this fight, considering the amount of money Pep was generating. The fight was originally scheduled for 15 rounds, but it was reduced to 10 rounds at the insistence of the New York State Athletic Commission, who was concerned that Pep would have a claim to the lightweight crown if he defeated Angnott over 15 rounds. The Associated Press reported it was a near capacity house at the garden as Sammy pushed in with swinging hooks through the first five rounds, beat Wee Willie to the punch repeatedly and piled up too big an edge for the New Englander to overcome. At the finish, the Associated Press card voted five rounds to Agnot, three to Pep and two even. There's no doubt that Sammy was tiring from the seventh round on and that there might have been a different story to tell if the fight had gone 15 rounds as it was originally scheduled. Well, following his first defeat in 62 fights, I mean, <laughs> it's just some going. Willie Pep returned to fight just featherweights from now on, winning four non-title fights from late March to April 1943 with all going the distance, which is something which always happened pretty much with Willie Pep. His first defence of the New York State Athletic Commission featherweight title was a rematch against Sal Bertolo, who was 45, 15 and 6 at Brayfield in Boston on June the 8th, 1943. Now, in front of a crowd of 14,000, the 2-1 to favourite Pep collected himself a nice or well, handsome $30,000 and the Associated Press, they reported on this fight and it said although Pep and Bertolo had put on a sizzling overweight match here in April. Their return engagement was so one-sided, it, it became monotonous long before they reached the 15th for final round. Pep kept Bartolo at bay with his stinging left jabs throughout and his highly polished footwork carried him out of danger almost every time the Bostonian tried to close in. Pep was held even in the first two rounds, but he won all the others. Despite the one-sided action, both battlers finished fresh and only slightly damaged. Writer Bob Considine described the bout as a barroom brawl, complete with slugging, rustling and crushing football blocks. So, <laughs> a good description there. Pep believed he did enough to win the fight, saying I beat him, I didn't get it. That's all. I beat him at Madison Square Garden. I gave him the decision. I didn't have a mark on my face after that fight. I outboxed him. So Pep was sworn into the armed forces 
and World War II in June of 1943 and was made a troop leader. He was actually quoted as saying that I do my best. It's just like another fight. It was not given any special treatment when he got there. He said, so I joined the Navy and they made me a water boy for the football team. I was champion of the world. Can you believe that? I hated the Navy. I was the water boy to the football team for Christ's sakes. It treated me very unfair. I was in the Navy for two and a half years. Pep was inducted into the army after leaving the Navy and he said I was an MP in the guardhouse. I did nothing to speak of. They gave me a gun and a club and I used to go to sleep in the jailhouse. I was very poorly handled. I didn't get to give any speeches. Nothing. Now, while Pep didn't return to the ring until April the 4th, 1944, Joseph, or as we know him, Sandy Sadler, and we'll come to why Sandy in a moment, was born in Boston, Massachusetts. His father, Alexander, was a tall British West Indian man who came from the slave trade before he immigrated to the United States. When Sandy was a toddler, the family moved to Harlem in New York, where they remained. On a side note, he is the uncle to another Joseph Sadler, who would go on to become a pioneering hip-hop artist and DJ. His name is Grandmaster Flash. Due to Sandy's size, he was keen on basketball, but he fell into boxing. I liked boxing. When I was a kid, I always did like boxing. I went to school, and at three o'clock... I went to PAL to train and box, that's the Police Athletic League. Now under the tutelage of trainer Dick Bruno, he fought as a flyweight and bantamweight, but Sadler's terrific amateur career scared off the competition, and he said, I couldn't get any more fights. A lot of the times they'd say, all right Sandy, we have someone for you. I'd go out this night and then they'd say the man didn't show up or something. I went back the following night, then went back the next week. There was no fights. By the time he was 17, and no one wanting to fight him in the amateurs, he decided to turn professional, just shy of his 18th birthday, and he told his handlers, let me go. And he turned over on March the 7th, 1944. As an amateur, he won 50 bouts and lost only three. Another impressive amateur career. Now, while fighting as an amateur, Sadler actually impressed a boxing manager, Charlie Johnston, and decided to take him into the pros. Now, at the same time as having Sandy Sadler, Charlie also managed the legendary light heavyweight, Archie Moore, who at that point was in the middle of fighting all that murderer's row crew. Now, a boxing publicist actually got the idea to turn a black New Yorker into a Scotsman, believe it or not. Hence that nickname, Sandy. Now, photos are actually taken of him grinning in gloves and Scottish garb that included tartan plaid shorts and a tamo shante plus a brimless cap with a bubble in the centre. So they dressed him up as a Scot, basically. He went on uh, to wear plaid robe and shorts and was described by Philip Levine as a working class, who was a working class poet and a fight fan as a deaf in red play trunks, that's what he called him. At some time during 1944, Sadler actually served briefly in the Navy. But we're not quite sure when that was before he uh, made his professional debut, or it was after his professional fight. We, we're not quite sure. But what we do know is that his first professional fight was actually arranged with the help of Willie Pep's manager at the time, who was Lou Vizushi. He was asked to find a suitable first fight for Sadler and chose a guy called Earl Rays, the New England champion. Now Sadler defeated Royce in an eight round decision while at ringside Pep and Vizushi actually apparently sat enjoying the evening as well. So sat in those early days the, the featherweight champion of the world was sitting at ringside watching Sadler. Sadler was actually due to fight Royce in a rematch for his second fight but things changed and this is what Sadler recalled. He said that I'm on the train going to fight Royce, as I think. And I see this fighter, Jock Leslie, that I've heard about. I asked him what he's doing. And he says he's going to Hartford to fight someone called Sadler. I said, no, no, you ain't. Because that's me and I'm fighting Earl. But Leslie was right. I found out soon enough. Sadler was actually matched terribly in his just his second professional fight against the guy that would fight for the featherweight title against Willie Pep just three years later. 
Leslie, of course, was a step too far and sadly remembered. I was TKO'd. I was never knocked out. He stopped me in about the third or fourth round. It was actually the third. It was too much experience for me. He didn't knock me out or anything, but the referee stopped the fight and said I couldn't continue because this guy was very clever. That would be Sadler's first and last stoppage defeat in over 150 fights. Sadler sarcastically told Neil Allen of Boxing Monthly and old Willie's manager just thought he was doing me a favour. He finished 1944 competing in 22 fights as a bantamweight with a record of 19-2-1. and Sadler's first fight in the new year was reported by the New York Times on January 16, 1945 against Lucky Johnson. And he said simply, Sandy Sadler knocked Johnson out cold with his first punch. During the calendar year of 1945, Sadler fought a total of 24 times, winning them all. 17 were by knockout, 14 consecutive and 7, like the Johnson fight, came in the very first round. Moving back to Willie Pep, and he finished off an impressive 1944 with 16 wins, 14 by decision, 1 stoppage and 1 knockout. His biggest fight came on September 29, 1944, when he made his second defence of the New York State Athletic Commission featherweight title against Chalky Wright in their rematch at Madison Square Garden. The United Press reported, Pep achieved his 79th victory in 80 professional fights by jabbing the elongated Chalky from whom he wrestled the title in 1942 all over the ring. Pep beat Wright so decisively that he stands head and shoulders above current featherweights. There were no knockdowns, although Pep slipped to his glove tips in the 7th round and to his knees in the 8th. Pep suffered a mouse under his left eye and right bled freely from his nose in the closing sessions. Well, a month after Sadler knocked out Lucky Johnson, Willie Pep took on the former NBA champion who was Phil Taranova in another defence of his featherweight title. James P. Dawson of the New York Times, who will be mentioned quite a lot, and the New York Times in general, they actually reported this fight and they said with a masterful exhibition of which few thought him capable, Willie Pep retained his title as he gave rough, rugged, eager and willing but patiently or painfully inadequate Phil Taranova a boxing lesson in 15 rapid rounds at Madison Square Garden in front of just over 10,000 fans. The receipts amounted to $48,701 and boxing like a master, Pep galloped impressively to his 86th ring triumph in a career of 87 bouts carrying off a unanimous decision. I mean, it's incredible. Dawson then went on to explain Pep's performance as a revelation last night, a miniature modified Harry Greb throwing punches from all angles and a finished boxer, a master ring man, a skillful, cool, calculating master of the art of hit and get away in a demonstration of boxing science that was inescapable the more so since it came so unexpectedly. I mean, they're high, high praise there. This was the sole defense of his title in a total of eight fights in 1945. He won seven and drew one against a guy called Jimmy McAllister. And the Baltimore Sun actually described the bout as uh, generally to be the finest featherweight fight seen here in many years. McAllister actually rocked Pep three times and sent him to the floor in the second with a right hand to the chin. Pep should have used this fight as a learning curve for another of his future fights as he happened to have taken McAllister very lightly. We'll come to that soon. Both stood their ground in the middle of the ring and traded toe-to-toe, but Pep was at his strongest in rounds five through to seven. Even with the slight blemish on his record, Willie Pep collected the Ring Magazine Fighter of the Year for 1945. I'm not surprised a record like that is insane. Going back to Sadler, and he had another active year in 1946, fighting 15 times, winning 13 and knocked out nine. One of his most destructive knockout victories came on April the 9th, 1946, when the New York Times described Joe Sandy Sadler knocked out Ralph LaSalle of Puerto Rico in 44 seconds of the first in a scheduled six-rounder. However, it wasn't all plain sailing for the rising contender. He lost twice to Bobby McQuilla and Phil Terranova. 
The Detroit Free Press reported on the first of the two defeats, explaining that McQuilla gained all the officials' votes because he was a two-handed battler, whereas Sandy was only using his left. Each fighter left bleeding from a wound under his left eye. The New York Times reported on the other bout. Former featherweight champion Phil Terranova punched out a close 10-round decision over his fellow townsman, Sandy Sadler, before 5,000 spectators at the University of Detroit Stadium tonight. The taller Sadler piled up points in the early rounds, especially on infighting, but Terranova rallied in the later stages to get the decision. The New York Times also reported on July 25th, 1946, that State Boxing Commissioner John J. Hettish today impounded Harlan Featherweight Sandy Sadler's purse and ordered his manager, Charlie Johnston, to appear before the commission to explain his actions at last night's Sadler Phil Terranova match. Following the decision last night, which went to Terranova, Johnston rushed the referee, Sam Hennessy, and noisily denounced the verdict. By the end of 1946, Sadler was a fully fledged featherweight and was ranked at number seven in the yearly rankings by the Ring magazine. British boxing journalist Harry Mullen referred to Sadler as a highly refined master of the ignoble aspects of the noble art. There have been few better featherweight champions and even fewer dirtier ones. Well, on the same day of that New York Times reported that Sadler's purse was actually confiscated. Willie Pep defeated Jackie Graves in one of the most famous and exciting fights of his career. Now, it was reported that Pep went down twice, Graves nine times, before Pep won by stoppage in the eighth round. Now, after the bout, Willie Pep said, he's a tough kid. He was, it was a tough fight. I hit him as hard and as often as I've ever hit anyone. Yes, he has the style to beat any featherweight in the business, including Phil Terranova, who obviously after beating Sadler was the next highly ranked contender. However, this is the important bit. None of the reports at the time mentioned a punchless third round specifically. Now, the St. Paul sports writer, Dom Riley, he was the guy we're going to talk about in a minute. So he's the one that didn't mention it, neither did any reports. There has been a myth, I'm sure if anyone's read out about Willie Pep, they'll know this. So there has been a myth, or is it a reality? We're not quite sure. That Willie Pep won a round against Graves without actually throwing a single punch. Now, in an interview with fightbeat.com, Pep was asked what he would want people to remember about him. And he said, that I was a pretty good fighter and that I'm the only guy that won a round without throwing a punch. I did it against Jackie Graves. I told a sports writer before the fight I wasn't going to throw a punch. I spun him, slipped punches, I blocked punches, but I didn't throw a punch. He fell down, he went through the ropes, but he never hit me. I never hit him. So at the end of the round, the judges gave me the round in his hometown, and I was very proud of that. Now, the story goes that Dom Riley, who was the St. Paul's sports writer, visited Pep before the fight, and Willie suggested that he could fight a punchless round, and in his own words, he said, fake well enough to fool the judges and the spectators. Now, it was described that he would perform that feat in the third round, but why didn't Riley mention it in his report when it happened in 1946, considering it's a long myth about Willie Pep? Riley explained, I was busy writing and doing broadcasts. It just slipped my mind. Years later, he finally wrote, It was an amazing display of defensive boxing skill. So adroit, so cunning, so subtle, that the roaring crowd did not notice Pep's tactics were completely without offence. Many journalists are split on the punchless third round. Whether it's fact or fiction, it's almost irrelevant because Willie Pep will always go down in history as the only man to do it. Boxing historian, the late Burt Sugar, was more than happy to side with this remarkable story of the defensive mastery when he said, I give Willie Pep the benefit of the doubt. The month before the punchless round, on June 7th, 1946, Pep made his fourth defence of the New York State Athletic Commission featherweight title against the NBA champion, Sol Bartolo, who was now 71, 17 and 6 in their third and final rescheduled meeting at Madison Square Garden. The fight was promoted by Mike Jacobs and in front of a crowd of almost 10,000, Pep 
knocked Patolo out in the 12th with a right to the chin. Before the knockout, the fight was an even battle, but when Batolo returned to his corner after the ninth, he told them he thought his jaw was broken. Indeed, Batolo's thoughts were confirmed when x-rays showed that he had suffered a fracture on the lower left side of his jaw that needed operating on, on the following day. Pep ended the year with 18 wins with 11, coming by stoppage or way of knockout, defending his title only once but becoming the unified and recognised featherweight champion of the world. Moving back to Sadler, and he began a successful and active 1947 in style, knocking out two opponents in January. The New York Times described the action the next day, on January the 28th. Sandy Sadler gave a £10 weight advantage to Humberto Savala and knocked out the game little lightweight in the seventh round of their scheduled 10 round feature bout. Sadler outboxed and outpunched his rival throughout. Now, while Sadler continued his rise, Willie Pep had a less active year, but by no fault of his own. In January 1947, Pep was flying back to Hartford from Miami when his chartered flight crashed in a snowstorm near Caramel, New Jersey. Three died and 18 were injured. And Pep remembered that I woke up on my stomach. People were moaning and groaning. The plane was ripped to shreds. My back was killing me. Now, according to Pep, in his book, Friday's Heroes, the New Jersey doctors couldn't actually determine the depth of his injuries. He was transferred to Hartford Hospital, where they discovered two cracked vertebrae and a broken leg. He was put in a body cast for five months, and Pep said that if it had have gone undetected much longer, it would have healed wrong, and I would have had a hunchback all his life. It was my youth and my luck that got me over it. Doctors actually informed him that he may never walk again, let alone fight again. Now, with Pep obviously out of action, Sandy Sadler was eager to force his way into a world title shot, whether that meant fighting Pep or not. And he was just keen to impress. And the, and the New York Times, once again, will always report a lot from New York Times, actually reported on April 15, 1947, on his bout with Charlie Cabby Lewis. Now it said Joe Sandy Sadler of Harlem and Lewis of Brooklyn met in a 10 round featured bout in St. Nicholas Arena last night. Sadler was the winner by decision, largely on his aggressiveness as he constantly backed Lewis around the ring. The next month, Sadler went on to impressively knock out the future lightweight champion, Joe Brown, in just three rounds at the Coliseum Arena in New Orleans. After putting Brown down heavily right at the end of the second round, the New Orleans Times reported that Brown was out cold and his seconds couldn't bring him around before the start of the third round and they threw in the towel when the gong sounded. Sadler's impressive destruction of lightweights continued into the summer of 1947 when he drew with another future lightweight champion in Jimmy Carter in Washington, D.C. Two of the judges who scored the fight a draw after 10 rounds overruled referee Charlie Reynolds, who had Sadler winning. By now, Sadler was making significant progress at making a claim for the featherweight world title by not beating and knocking many contenders in his own weight class. He was doing it at the higher division as well, against future world champions. Sadler recalled his predicament at the time and he said, I knocked out Joe Brown, then I fought Jimmy Carter to a draw. I fought Orlando Zulita for the Junior Lightweight Championship, and I won the championship. But I never put it on the line. I was busy fighting these heavier guys anyway. I was weighing 129 and fighting these guys that weighed 136 or 138 pounds. I couldn't get the featherweights, so the majority of them were lightweights. In an interview from In This Corner by Peter Heller, Sadler described his journey and he said, I used to fight maybe twice a week. I was knocking them off like two, three rounds. Back in the days when I was boxing, they had guys that were pretty good fighters. Sadler was being modest in that statement. He was so feared that he was forced to fight virtually every place but his hometown of New York. He did, however, finally get the chance to fight at Madison Square Garden. In August 1947, when he stopped Miguel Acevedo due to a bad cut in the seventh on the undercard of a Sugar Ray Robinson bill. After losing to Humberto Sierra by split decision in the October, a fight where Sadler hit the deck in the first round, he ended the year with visits to Venezuela 
and Cuba. After being told that he might not walk again, let alone box again, Willie Pep had made incredible progress in his recovery. So much so that he wanted to begin training in June as soon as that body cast come off. But doctors obviously recommended that he waited until October. Pep disagreed. And after the removal of his cast, he went straight to the gym Then told his manager to get him a fight. Incredibly, Pep did return to the ring after surviving death. And that, I mean, it's incredible. And, and this is what he remembered in his return fight. He said, five weeks later, I had a fight. I'll never forget it with a tough little Puerto Rican kid. Victor Flores, his name was. I went 10 tough rounds. Now, this was really a test because usually you get a guy you can easily handle. But this guy was there punching me for 10 rounds, 10 tough rounds. There were two doctors at ringside and they were totally surprised. Those 10 rounds with a tough Puerto Rican kid got me back on my way. Even more incredibly, Pep went on to win seven bouts in just 66 days. But his quick return to the ring came with its problems and he recalled that my loss was the insurance company that I was suing. They said I was better than ever, so I didn't get any money from that plane crash. I think I got $15,000 for my expenses, and after I paid everybody, I was left with about 3000 I had sued for 250000 but after I started boxing and winning, the suit was thrown out. But I had my trunks. Although Pep got back to winning ways, the biggest question was just how much did that accident take from him? Now, in an interview with FightBeat.com, they posed to him that very question. Do you think you were a step slower when you returned to the ring? And Pep responded, it has to slow you down. I was always a speedster. They told me I'd never fight again. But I said, look, I'm a fighter. I got hurt in January. I had a cast on my chest and a cast on my leg for five months. They took the cast off in June. I boxed in July. He, Victor Flores, was a tough kid. He kept coming, but I kept outboxing him, and I was on my way. Then on August the 22nd, 1947, Pep made another defence of his featherweight title against a guy who beat Sadler in his second professional fight, Jock Leslie, who was 58, 9 and 4 at the time. The fight was staged at the Atwood Stadium in Flint, Michigan, and Pep recalled, I defended my title against Jock Leslie, who was the number one contender in his hometown. Now, when you go into a hometown, you've got to beat your man, without doubt, or you won't get it. And this was for the championship of the world. There was no problem as to who won the fight. I stopped him in 11 rounds. Pep fought seven more times before making his next defence of his title on February the 24th, 1948, against Humberto Sierra, who was 47-3 and three at the Orange Bowl in Miami. The referee on this rainy night was none other than the former heavyweight champion of the world, Jack Dempsey, who stopped the fight after Sierra was floored in the 10th round. Humberto was also down in the second round, but it made a close fight for six rounds in front of 10,000 in an open top stadium. Pep never defended his world title again until Sadler, but he won 11 more fights. All but two went the 10 or 8 round distance. Now, while Pep defended his world title twice since the plane crash, Sadler was still impressively marching onto a collision course with the champion. From February to May 1948, he had nine fights and won all of them, knocking out four. But he slipped up against a guy called Chico Rosa, 32-3, and three, in Hawaii on June the 29th, 1948, losing a split decision. Now, the Honolulu advisor that reported on that fight had echoes of Harry Mullen's statement earlier that there were fewer, dirtier fighters than Sadler. Now, the report actually explained that Sadler lost points in both the fourth and the seventh round for low blows, which eventually cost him the, the decision in a close fight. Very few solid blows were landed as Sadler scored with his left hand while Rosa used his speed to outbox Sadler. Following that defeat, Sadler knocked out his last three opponents in three rounds or less before the first fight with Willie Pep on October the 29th, 1948. The boxing register actually said that with his phenomenal string of knockouts, Sadler probably deserved a title shot before Pep finally agreed to fight him. 
His record was a ridiculous one and one that can be varied depending on your source, but a majority accept that he had 93 fights. He won 85, lost just six, drew two and knocked out 56. I mean, this is a featherweight in just over three years. 13 of those fights were on foreign soil, but he defeated seven national champions. I had to recall that I was number one contender and Pep had to fight me. I boxed in Argentina, Venezuela, Chile, Uruguay, Paraguay. I boxed in Panama. I boxed in the Philippines. I boxed in Cuba. And he just had to fight me. Willie Pep and Sandy Sadler met on October the 9th and signed the formal articles with the New York State Athletic Commission for the scheduled 15 round championship match at Madison Square Garden in 20 days time. The rivals also posted checks for $1,000 each as weight and appearance forfeits. Willie Pep, who was 26 years old, on a streak of 73 fouts without defeat and a career record of 134 wins, one loss and one draw. Therefore, Pep and his team had no fear going into the title defence against Andy Sadler, while at the height of his glittering career. Boxing journalists pointed out that Pep had beaten three fighters who had defeated Sadler in Jock Leslie, Phil Terranova and Humberto Sierra. So logically to them and to Pep, this was going to be another straightforward defence. Pep was so confident that he called Sadler a thin, weak-looking guy who looks like you could go puff and knock him over. Yes, Sadler was freakishly thin and lanky for a featherweight. He stood at 5'9 and dwarfed his opponents. His jab was long, fast and solid and his signature right cross was so devastating he had knocked out more than half of his opponents. He had worked extremely hard to get his world title chance in his 94 professional fight, even though he had been ranked highly for three years. Sadly recalled years later the length of time it took him to get his chance while pointing out the problems of boxing today. And he said, my 66 fight or 67 fight, it was actually his 94th, that's when I actually fought for the title. But today a guy has 16 fights and there he is. He's a title contender already. Mainly, it's this. We haven't got any clubs going in New York. You have about two clubs in the area, but then you had about 13 clubs. Not only was Sadler feared because of his destructive power, but he also had another weapon, something that we briefly mentioned earlier, and that was the great Archie Moore. By this point, he had taken a special interest in the 22-year-old Sadler and his title shot, against Willie Pep. Now the old mongoose, Archie Moore, taught Sadler how to slip, get inside, cover up properly and use his punching power even more explosively. I mean, if that's even possible. Sadler spoke about what he had learned from Moore in an interview with Peter Heller. And he said, Archie taught me quite a bit how to punch, punching from the ball of my feet. That was very important. Moore sparred with Sadler and advised him that he needed to press the fight. Sadler said in the same interview that he wanted me to stay on top of him. Give Pep no leverage because if you gave Pep any leverage, for Christ's sake, you could clean forget it then. Interestingly, but not surprisingly, due to the era, the fight was actually rumoured to be fixed and that Pep was told to take a dive. A hint of foul play was enough for chairman of the New York State Athletic Commission, Eddie Egan, to address the fighters on the day of the fight at noon for their weigh-in. He said, I am holding you responsible to hu- uphold the good name of boxing. There are rumours of a fix before every fight, but we don't pay any attention to them. You are two honest athletes fighting in a great class for a great championship, and you will represent boxing tonight. Pep said, don't worry about me. I'll be there to win. The fight took place two days before Halloween in 1948. The featherweight champion, Willie Pep, stepped into the ring at Madison Square Garden to defend his title for the seventh time. He had held the title for five years, or five plus years. Pep was the three-to-one betting favourite and took home 50% of the $56,000 gate receipts, while the challenger earned just 10%. The man in the middle and sole judge was the legendary Ruby Goldstein, The first instalment of this legendary rival began on October the 29th, 1948, in front of a crowd of just under 15,000. So now we are going to move in 
to the descriptions of this first fight and I'm going to talk through the first three rounds. So the first round saw Saddler press the attack with body shots and hard left jabs, not allowing Pep to use his magic feet. Saddler attacked Pep from the beginning, just like Archie Moore had coached him. Pep did return fire, but opted to hold. However, he was swamped by the challenger. After separating, Sadler resumed the attack to the body with left hooks, but the damage to the head was already showing signs as Pep's nose started to bleed. Pep got in some shots in the second, but was peppered with Sadler's relentless left jab to the head. In the third, Sadler continued to press the action and walk through Pep's punches that were not having any effect, punishing the champ with both hands. Midway through the round, Sadler knocked Pep down from a single snapping and twisting left hand. Pep got up at nine, but was caught with a left hook and powerful lean right hand to the jaw. Pep went down again for another nine count. The bell saved him. So into the fourth round, the next round saw Sadler land a series of rights to the jaw, as Pep's return was described as feeble by some reporters. Sadler recalled, I stayed on him and as he relaxed, I would punch. I just kept on like that until I actually knocked him out, knocked him stoned in that fourth round out. You could count to 50 power, I'm telling you. Sadler wasn't joking either. He drove Pep into the ground like what one reporter described as a hammer to a nail with a dynamite right hand, knocking Pep out for the first time in his career. In summary, Joseph C. Nichols of the New York Times said Pep had little spring in his legs, no sharpness to his punching and an inability to get away from the tantalizing and at the same time punishing left to the face. Sadler constantly threw at him. Pep let Sadler force the fight without wreck, they described. And the challenger went about carving up Willie, sharp lefts to the face and short rights to the body and head. In his report, Nichols said, the manner in which he disposed of Willie made it clear no collusion was necessary, that he had enough guns at his disposal to take care of Pep on his own. The battle simply proved that Willie didn't have enough to hold off the eager young Negro. After the bout, Chairman Egan said both boys did their utmost. Pep said after the second defeat of his career, I was in good shape, but he just overcome me. He got me cold and knocked me down and they stopped the fight. I went down two or three times. I held him too lightly. I wasn't ready mentally for a tough fight. The Milwaukee Journal said that Pep was now finished. And they wrote, Willie Pep is all washed up after losing his featherweight boxing championship to Sandy Sadler. That seems to be the consensus following Friday night's stunning knockout victory for Sadler, a lean Harlem puncher in 2 minutes 38 of the fourth round. Now, Bert Sugar and Teddy Atlas have Sadler's victory over Pep at number seven in their greatest boxing upsets and explained that the odds makers had only examined the bottle, not its contents, in assessing Sandy Sadler. Sadler would later claim he fought for little more than training expenses, but he was so eager to get home with goodies for his family that he called his mother and asked her to stay up for his return. He proudly marched home and tossed two bags on the floor in front of his mum and six siblings. One bag was filled with fizzy drinks, the other, quarts of ice cream and cookies. At the bottom of the bag was the receipt, $11.30. This just demonstrates Sandy Sadler's modest upbringing after causing such a major upset by knocking out the overconfident champion. This was only the beginning of a four-fight rivalry that still remains one of the greatest in featherweight, if not boxing history. Then there was a clause in the fight contract between Willie Pep and the Bouts promotion company, 20th Century Sporting Club. Harry Markson was the new managing director, announced on October the 30th, 1948, that he planned a February 11 return match between Sadler and Pep to take place at Madison Square Garden. However, Pep's manager, Lou Vizucci, refused to sign until x-rays were taken to determine whether the former champion had actually suffered a broken nose. Sadler's manager, Charlie Johnston, revealed the details of the contract, saying that our contract called for a rematch 120 days from the date of the bout if Sadler won. 
Johnston then disclosed that he had received an offer from English promoter Norman Hurst for a fight in England and another to fight in Cleveland on December the 6th for the Christmas fund. He also planned for Sadler to have several over-the-weight fights soon. Said a fight with the lightweight champion at the time, who was Ike Williams, would not be made for a year at least. Both the 20th Century Club and the Tournament of Champions were trying to arrange a Pep Williams fight before he lost to Sadler, so the rival promoters began to inquire with the new champ instead. The results of Pep's x-ray concluded that he did indeed suffer a fracture to his nose. Sadler fought five non-title bouts and won all of them with uh, two knockouts, two stoppages and one decision in between the first and the second Willie Pep fights. About three weeks after his upset win, he stopped Thomas Beto in the second round and the New York Times reported that Sadler then broke through with a left to the nose and there was an inaudible crack as the blow landed and sent Beto down for the count. If you didn't, I mean, that's a great description of how powerful Sadler was. Ten days later, he took a decision over Dennis Pat Brady. A week later, he knocked out Eddie Giasa in Cleveland. And then just over a week later, he stopped Terry Young in Madison Square Garden. Sadler's last opponent in the new year was against Young Finnegan of Panama, which was described as a rough battle where the lanky sharpshooting Sadler buried a left in Finnegan's midsection and then nailed a hard right to the jaw in the decisive round, which was the fifth of a scheduled ten. Sadler wanted to give something back to boxing, so he appeared at the opening of the Police Athletic League's Fun Drive, the place where he had learned how to box and competed as an amateur with the Powell Boxing Programmes. A New York Times article in January reported of a campaign to raise $1 million, which was opened by Mayor O'Dwyer at City Hall, along with a group of professional athletes. Like Sadler, each had been a Powell participant, and they included baseball players, Bobby Thompson, who would hit the winning home run dubbed the shot heard round the world, Hank Majeske and George Sternweiss. The article explained that the 1949 budget will provide an athletic programme for 300,000 boys and girls. Pep wasn't as active as Sadler, but he did have to wait for his nose to heal. He fought just twice and won both by decision. First against Hermie Freeman at the Boston Garden five days before Christmas and then Teddy Davis in St. Louis. This now leads us nicely into the rematch, which came just over three months later. The promoter, Harry Markson, held little hope that the rematch would be a success. And a New York Times report actually referred to his surprise when the match proved to be a hot ticket. He said Markson was agreeably surprised when the box office windows were first opened and the flood of orders for tickets came pouring in. He was even more surprised when these orders continued. And yesterday, the fight in Presero was downright bewildered as a late rush of applicants occurred a certain capacity house. What seemed a white elephant at the start was transformed into a golden calf, one that promised to be worth more than $80,000 at the gate. The rematch once again took place at Madison Square Garden on February 11th, 1949. This time, there were three officials, referee and judge Eddie Joseph, and the other two judges were Jack O'Sullivan and Frank Forbes. The 22-year-old Sandy Sadler was initially the betting favourite at 7-5, to five, but the odds changed the night before the fight actually sashed to even money. Sadler's career record now stood at 91-6-4, and the challenger, Willie Pep, who was 26, had an even more impressive record of 136, 2 and 1. A crowd of just over 19,000, an indoor or a new indoor record for the featherweight title fight at the time, paid more than an estimated figure totaling 87,563. It was reported that each fighter got 30% of the net receipts and that 5,000 fans were actually turned away at the gate for the first Madison Square Garden sellout since 1946. So into the rematch we go, and rounds one to four, and when the bell sounded, Pep went on the attack, to the astonishment of the sellout crowd. 
he attacked the face of Sadler with his quick left, landing what some say was 37 jabs in the opening round. The hand speed was back, something many observers thought had faded. The New York Times called Pep Start a demonstration of blinding speed that had Sandy looking like a novice. Sadler continued to try and cut off the ring and close the gap, taking Pep's jabs in the process, but to no avail. Pep kept his hard-hitting rival off him by way of counter-punching, which was described by the Chicago Tribune. Sadler was moving forward, measuring Willie with unblinking eyes, but Pep was too much for him with his counter-punching. Although Pep was free-flowing in his footwork and counter-punching, he was warned by the referee for wrestling in the first round and raking the lace of his glove down Sadler's face in the third. Pep continued to give Sadler a boxing lesson through the first three rounds, but was able to prevent the champ's dangerous inside game. One report described his workers jumping in and out, twisting and turning, pushing and pulling. In the fourth, the champion began to close the gap and landed savage shots to the body. Numerous times, Sadler missed with headshots by only a few inches, which demonstrated the excellent head movement from Pep. If they had have landed, Pep would have been left rendered on the canvas, like in the first meeting. So rounds five to 12, and, and Sadler landed a hard left in, in the fifth, which opened a cut on Pep's right cheek, which bled throughout the rest of the fight. However, Pep ignored it, kept dominating, and outboxed Sadler in this round. Pep won seven of the first eight rounds as James P. Dawson of the New York Times reported that in fitful bursts, Pep hammered Sadler with his lefts and rights from all angles and in tireless fashion while Sadler missed out most of his missed most of his blows. Pep landed all the punches in the boxing manual, attacking from every angle imaginable and displaying his super herb or supreme footwork while avoiding the aggressive attempts from his rival to land a knockout blow. Sadler did begin to work his way back into the fight and landed a very hard right to the jaw in the 10th. This blow was described as having Pep teetering. It was reported that Sadler's onslaught was so effective that ringsiders thought the fight would be stopped. However, Pep once again rallied and electrified the crowd with his intelligence through the 11th and 12th rounds. Dawson wrote that Pep pelted Sadler with every blow known in boxing. Sadler started to gain momentum in the late rounds, opening a new cut over Pep's right eye in the 13th and slamming home numerous heavy shots, but Pep weathered the storm. The 14th was Sadler's, who rocked the former champion with a right and left hook to the jaw, which shook the Hartford gladiator to his toes. Into round 15 and Pep answered the call in the final round and came out guns blazing. Dawson reported, Pep gave his greatest thrill in the 15th when after weathering the jarring fire of the 14th, he came back to fight Sadler all over the ring with a strength that few, if any, thought he possessed. At the final bell, Pep was exhausted, doubled over and desperately hanging on to Sadler's waist. With blood streaming from his damaged face, Pep did not look like the winner. Afterwards, he needed three stitches over each eye, three on his left cheek and two over his right. Sadler said, I don't think he'll fight me again. The crowd erupted when the scores were announced and Pep's hand was raised. The Chicago Tribune reported, Wild turmoil broke out in the garden, which was located with rabid Pep fans as announcer Johnny Adel gave the unanimous decision. The official scorecards read Frank Forbes 9 to 5, Jack O'Sullivan 9 to 6 and Eddie Joseph 10 to 5 all in favor of the new featherweight world champion Willie Pep. The Associated Press scored the fight 9 to 6 for Pep and they reported that Pep boxed brilliantly all the way against his heavier punching opponent bouncing in and out with his dazzling array of jabs, hooks and right crosses. The United Press reported the sellout crowd that jammed the guard and witnessed one of the finest and bloodiest featherweight battles on record. Both men were smeared with blood and bleeding from face and eye cuts at the final bell. Willie Pep had become the first man to regain the title at 126 pounds since George Dixon back in 1898 and the bout was named Fight of the Year by the ring. And perhaps the words of the famed boxing journalist who have 
continually mentioned, and we will still do, is James P. Dawson. He best illustrated the enormity of what Pep had achieved when he wrote that Pep put on the greatest battle of his career. He called on every ounce of strength within his compact little body and all the guile he had accumulated through the 11 years as an amateur and professional fighter to gain the triumph. How well he succeeded is reflected in the tabulation of the officials and in riding to victory, he proved to be one of the greatest featherweight champions the ring has known. Red Smith observed in the Chicago Sun-Times, he says, if Willie had chosen a life of crime, he would have been the most accomplished pickpocket since the Artful Dodger. Members of the boxing press were asking him where he had learned the marvellous moves, which was second nature to him. He struggled to answer. It was like asking Hemingway where he learned to write. Jimmy Cannon, legendary sports journalist, wrote sometimes, there seemed to be music playing for him alone and he danced to his private orchestra and the ring became his ballroom. The great writer W.C. Hines called Pep the artist supreme and in his book, Once They Heard the Cheers, Hines actually wrote that when I watched him box, it used to occur to me that if I could just listen carefully enough, I would hear the music. He turned boxing contests into ballets, performances by a virtuoso in which the opponent trying to punch him out became an unwilling partner in dance. The details of which were so exquisite that they were evoked joy and sometimes even laughter. In an interview with Peter Heller, Sadler explained the fight as one of them things. He put on a very good boxing exhibition. He pulled and he slipped and he carried on. He fought a very good fight and he beat me by a 15-round decision. I stayed on top of him and I cut him up and whatnot, but he just got the decision over me. Pep said, greatest fight of my life. Sandy's a good, quick fighter. I make up my mind to get in better shape and not hold him lightly. He was full of confidence. He had knocked me out. He had all the confidence oozing. I had to overcome that and I did. It was a very, very tough fight and I had to keep on the go. He hit me with some pretty good punches. He shut me up a, f a few times. All I know is I was on my toes for 15 rounds, and I knew I was in a fight. I outboxed him and won back the title. That was the greatest night of my life. I realised how great it was to be champion again, and I know I had won it from a good fighter. According to the New York Times, Sadler's manager, Charlie Johnston, protested to the New York State Athletic Commission about the lack of action taken by referee Eddie Joseph. And he said, everything the referee did was advantageous to Pep and damaging to Sadler. He went on to say that the ref let Pep get away with raking in the face, hitting from behind, wrestling, stepping on feet and pushing and never allowed any infighting, which was Sadler's best chance of winning. Well, interestingly, which is something we would love to see today, it was Eddie Joseph that replied to that dirty tactic allegation, saying there was a little roughness, but none of it was too bad. Sadler would grab Pep around the waist and punch the kidneys, holding and hitting. Pep stepped on Sadler's toes and pushed him off balance. I cautioned Pep for healing, another phrase for raking, in the third round. Before the round started, I ordered Pep's handlers to remove some Vaseline. They applied to Pep's left arm and neck, obviously to prevent Sadler locking the arm in close or getting a firm grip of Pep's neck in close range fighting. And regarding the lack of infighting, he said, I tried to keep the fighting at long range out in the open so that the action would be clean to keep the boys from getting too rough at close quarters. So that response gave Johnson's infight and claim some credibility, but the fight was over and they would not meet again for another 19 months. Four days after winning the world title back, Pep got the red carpet rolled out for him in his hometown of Hartford, Connecticut. Governor Bowles gave him a silver trophy and a state legislature passed a resolution calling Pep the greatest champion of them all. Pep took the summer off and got married for the second time. He would marry a total of six times. He actually sent his manager a telegram that simply said, get married today, see you in a week, Willie. <laughs> Simple as that. Trouble was that Pep was actually scheduled to fight while on his honeymoon and left his opponent waiting. That error drew a suspension from the NBA 
for a couple of months. Apparently, he almost did a similar thing years before. Goldie Ahern of the New York Times reported Pep executed a similar matrimonial play about eight years ago. He didn't appear until the morning of the fight and with a bride he had acquired the evening before. But that time, the fight went on. Pep had 15 fights before the third saddle about, making three title defences. He stopped Eddie Crompo in seven rounds in his home state of Connecticut in front of over 10,000 adoring fans. In January 1950, Willie Pep landed a right uppercut on Charlie Riley in St. Louis that floored him for the full count in the fifth round. His third and successful defence was at the Garden against Frenchman Ray Famichon, who was 59-5, and five, winning a unanimous decision. The next day, on March 18th, IBC matchmaker Al Wheel offered Willie Pep a fight with Sandy Sadler. Lou Vizus was against the proposed rubber match because he felt that Sadler's terms were too high. However, the boxing fraternity disagreed. They feel that he is holding out for as long as possible because he knows how dangerous Sadler is. More fire was added to the fuel of that rumour after Pep's comfortable performance against Ray Franchman. The New York Times reported that although Pep had no trouble boxing his way to decision in the 15-round title defence, Pep impressed a good many observers as being past his peak. Woolley has had 150 professional fights now. Many consider him ripe for the taking by a fighter of Sadler's ability. After the knockback, Al Wheel was hoping to get the Frenchman into the ring against Sadler in hope that it would force Pep into fighting the winner. Unfortunately for Wheel, that fight never happened. Now, during the 19-month gap, Sadler had 23 fights, knocking out 10 and stopping 10 while travelling to three different countries. He put Jim Keary down for the count with, a, with body shots in London, England, on a Jack Salomon's card headlined by Freddie Mills. Sadler then collected a version of the NA of the NBA Super Featherweight title. The 130-pound division had effectively gone out of business from 1933 until December 1949 when Sadler briefly revived it with a split decision victory over Orlando Zolita in Cleveland, Ohio. After travelling to Cancarus, Venezuela and Toronto, Canada to record three more knockouts, he made one successful defence of that Super featherweight title, which was now only recognised by this point, not the NBA, but by Ohio, against uh, Loro Salas, also in Ohio, stopping the Mexican in the ninth. In the summer of 1950, the New York Times headlined a report, Pep signs to fight Sadler on September the 6th. The report went on to say that Willie Pep, veteran boxer from Hartford, Connecticut, signed yesterday to defend his World Featherweight Championship against Sandy Sadler of Harlem. The pair will meet in a 15-round bout at the Yankee Stadium. Promoter Jim Norris, president of the IBC, is confident that the battle will attract $250,000. Top price for the fight will be $20.00. Scrapping a previous contract with the IBC that guaranteed him, as in Willie Pep, $100,000 to oppose Sadler. Pep agreed to accept 45% of the gate. The challenger will receive 15%. The opening line on the fight favours Sadler as at odds of 5-7. to seven. The challenger's youth and heavier punching power serve to make him the choice, at least at this stage. One month later, news broke that there would be no broadcast of the fight. Radio and television were barred from the stadium. A New York Times article stated the IBC left his matter optional with the managers of the respective fighters and they decided against it. The fight would be delayed by a couple of days to September the 9th and the New York Times reported on the 7th. With four rounds of sparring today, Willie Pep ended preparations for the 15-round clash with a total of 88 rounds of preliminary work. Although the champion did not disclose his exact weight, he expressed confidence of a successful defence against Sadler. Pep boxed three rounds with Ray Castello of Havana and one with Johnny Carr of Brooklyn, impressing onlookers with his speed and cleverness. Before motoring to New York, Pep said, I don't expect an easy fight, but if Sadler wants to win the title, he will have to go after it. Sandy Sadler said, I'm ready. After completing heavy work for Friday's bout, 
Stadler went two rounds each against Wilbur Jefferson of Florida and Massino Sanna of Italy. The challenger, in all, has sparred 95 rounds for his third meeting with Pep. Even though Pep had produced one of his career best performances in the rematch, Sadler went into the fight as the 8-5 betting favourite. However, journalist James P. Dawson disagreed and said, The outcome depends on the physical condition of Pep. If it's as good as last time, he should win. However, Dawson did credit Sadler as one of the hardest hitters the division has ever known. A crowd of just over 38,000 produced a gross gate of over $262,000 with the Governor of Connecticut also in attendance at the Yankee Stadium. The New Haven Railroad announced a Willie Pep special that would carry 600 fans from Hartford to points surrounding the New York area. The attendance and gate receipts were a new featherweight record. The previous were set when Eugene Creek defeated Johnny Dundee at the Polo Grounds on July 26, 1923. Pep was making the fourth defence of the featherweight title in his second reign. He received 45% of the net gate, as we mentioned, he accepted, and, and Sadler 15%. The referee and the third judge was Ruby Goldstein. The other two judges were young Otto and Frank Forbes. So going into the fight and into rounds one to three of the third fight, Pep took control of the fight from the get-go, using his boxing skills as he had done in a rematch. Sadler was once again the aggressor, but was unable to land any scoring shots. James Dawson wrote, one of the most difficult targets the ring has ever known. Of course he was. And that Pep jabbed Sadler dizzy and had Sadler all at sea. So it was just a great early start from Pep. The jab wasn't Pep's only effective weapon. His left jab to the body was also landing in hope of tiring the challenger down the stretch. Sadler came alive in the third round as he charged through Pep's jabs and connected with a left hook of his own onto the champ's jaw and sent him down to the canvas. Although unhurt, Pep took a nine count before rising to his feet. He then managed to weather the storm from a Sadler attack but was cut under the left eye and left with a bloody nose. Pep said he butted me, but he continued to throw back with left jabs and hooks with the left and right, which caused swelling under Sadler's left eye. Now in the book, The 20th Century, by the editors of The Ring magazine, they described this third round as turning salty. They wrote, Pep pushed, pulled, bumped and stepped on Sadler's toes. Sadler wrestled and punched where he wasn't supposed to. Sadler recalled, that's how Willie wanted it. I know I had him in the third, but I was in no hurry. So moving in to rounds four to six, and after knocking Pep down in the previous round, Sadler smelled victory and charged out of the blocks in the fourth, looking to knock Pep out. However, the champion was not ready to buckle just yet. He came back with a desperate counter-attack out, punching Sadler while remaining elusive. Sadler was loading up for the big power punches that missed regularly as Pep showed off his world-class head movement and footwork. Into the fifth, and although Pep had been put down, he was in control of the fight by this point. The defending champion ducked a Sadler hook, retreated to the ropes, took Sadler's elbow, gave it a slight twist and sent Sadler flying. In the footage on YouTube, Pep is actually seen casually rearranging his trunks as Sadler is laid out on the deck. After being embarrassed, Sadler resumed his assault, but the brilliant Pep, as Dawson reported, was ducking under his foe's blows, cracking an overhand right to the face or head, or swinging a left to the body in combination with a right to the head. Pep had Sadler bewildered and helpless to stop or counter this fire. Into round seven, and and the seventh round, uh, Pep carried on where he had left off in the last round. However, Sadler's relentless pressure was never going to stop. The younger man landed a series of left hooks to Pep, continued to pepper and stick and jab with his left jab and hook to Sadler's head and body. By this point, Pep was ahead on two of the judges' scorecards with the other having it even, while Dawson had it six to one for Pep. By the seventh, Sadler's left eye was almost closed and Pep's left cheek was now constantly bleeding. In the final seconds of the rounds, They clinched in a neutral corner while jostling for position. During the pushing and pulling, Pep sustained a dislocated shoulder. 
while in the corner between rounds, one of Pep's cornermen urged the referee not to intervene. He wanted him to fight on, but Pep was in too much pain and actually got annoyed with his seconds. It was even reported that he momentarily seemed to be on the verge of punching his own handler. Dr. Vincent A. Nardellio diagnosed the injury as a dislocated left shoulder and authorised the announcement Pep would not continue. Sandy Sadler became a dual world champion, a two-time featherweight champion and the recognised super featherweight champion by the NBA. After the fight, Sadler promptly branded Willie Pep a quitter. Sadler's words were harsh on Pep because after further examination, Dr. Nardellio disclosed a soft tissue swelling and an immediate x-ray was ordered. Pep complained, He got a double arm lock on me in that last clinch on the ropes in the seventh round, and that's what I did it. I felt a crack in my shoulder and couldn't raise the arm when I went to my corner. I couldn't use my arms the way he did, but if I could, I'd have won. Sadler referred to the assault he had put on the body of Pep for the reason for the stoppage, but did accept the claim. I thought a punch to the kidney did it, but if they say I twisted the arm, okay, I twisted it. James P. Dawson wrote in the New York Times, It was unfortunate the bout ended as it did. It finished abruptly, a bout that was proceeding as a blazing pace between a marvellous little boxer and a slugger who was stalking his prey waiting for the kill he so confidently had predicted in advance. Unfortunate too for its effect on Pep's status, for the defending champion undeniably was on the road to victory. The only question was whether he could maintain the terrific pace. Indications were that he could. There was little more than 12 months before they would meet again for a fourth and final time, starting with Sadler, who fought 14 times, winning 12 and knocking out 8, but also lost twice in non-title bouts. In November and December, the new featherweight champion recorded back-to-back victories over 10 rounds before he took on the undefeated Del Flanagan, 43-0 with one draw, who was a more natural lightweight who had gone on to compete at welterweight and middleweight at the end of his career. The Detroit Press actually wrote that Flanagan weighed over 132 pounds, four more than Sadler. The St. Paul lightweight and stable mate of Sadler's arch rival and the the former featherweight king, Willie Pep, stunned a small crowd of 5,186 fans as he took a decision. Flanagan and Sadler made up their own version of the rules as they went along and it included everything from butting to wrestling, hitting on a break and a few other tactics not mentioned in polite circles. There were no knockdowns, but all three judges called it for Flanagan. In February, Sadler travelled to Havana, Cuba, to defend the Ohio-recognised super featherweight title. Again, the super featherweight title, is, it's a, it is under a NBA, but it's also Ohio as well. It's a bit of a mixture, This the history of that title. After knocking out the challenger, Diego Souza in just two rounds, the fight ended, but a riot ensued. The ring actually wrote that Souza stepped on Sadler's shoes and brushed his hair over his eyes during clinches. Sadler actually retaliated with a rabbit punches. They went down together, during which time Sadler landed a few punches. Referee Joe Kogo picked up the count at eight when Sadler had already arisen, but Souza was actually counted out. So they're both on the deck. Sadler gets up, Souza's out, and he gets counted out. The crowd thought that Sadler had fouled Souza, and this resulted in a riot. Another report said that police had to escort Sadler and the referee from the ring when the crowd of 10,000 yelled foul. Cushions and bottles were also thrown into the ring. Sandy Sadler understandably never returned to Cuba. By the summer of 1951, Sadler made successful trips to Luna Park in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and Santiago de Chile, of course, in Chile. Sadler's other loss came on August 27th, 1951, in a rematch against Paddy DiMarco in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Once again, Sadler faced another opponent who outweighed him, this time by eight pounds, and DiMarco used that extra weight to charge Sadler from the opening bell, pushing him against the ropes and keeping him pinned and not, not allowing him to find room. The decision in the end was a split one, with one judge scoring in favour of Sadler, but the other two scored it to DiMarco. That was Sadler's final fight before the fourth pep meeting. 
While Sadler had a difficult time in a couple of his fights, Willie Pep fought eight times, winning them all, three by stoppage and five decisions against no top ten contenders. In his first fight since injuring his left hand the previous September, Pep stopped Tommy Baker in four rounds in front of his beloved fans in Hartford, Connecticut on January the 30th, 1950. He even gave away his entire purse, donating it to the March of Dimes Infantile Paralysis Fund. Following the comfortable victory, the New York Times reported that the fourth fight with Sadler, which had been scheduled for February 23rd at Madison Square Garden, had been delayed for an indefinite period at the request of Pep, who required additional training. Pep went on to knock out Eddie Webb in February, took two decisions in March against decent opposition, scored a stoppage and points win in April, and another 10-round decision in June. On September the 8th, Sadler and Pep signed contracts in the State Athletic Commission office for a 15-round title fight at the Polo Grounds on Wednesday the 26th of September 1951. Jim Norris of the IBC did not allow each fighter's management teams to decide on television and radio. Instead, he came out publicly and said their fourth fight would be televised in 17 theatres in 13 cities only. A week before the fight, and Sadler was reported to have sparred 57 rounds in preparation for his defence of the title, while Pep celebrated his birthday by sparring seven rounds to bring his total to 92. At the suggestion of the State Athletic Commission, the IBC were told that they must use a new floor covering for the first time. The old felt covering was replaced by a plastic one using materials used in planes, tanks and helmets, described to have had a higher safety value. I believe someone died in the ring and this is their way of trying to make sure it didn't happen again. The 25-year-old Sadler, who was making his first defence at the featherweight title in his second reign, was installed the 9-5 to betting favourite. The champion's career record now stood at 128 wins, 9 defeats and 2 draws. And his 29-year-old challenger, who was trying to become the first featherweight to become a free-time champion, had a record of 163 and 1. A modest crowd of 13,836 showed up at the Polo Grands and produced a gate of 75,311, with the TV contribution raking in another $110,000. Sadler took home 37.5% of that net and collected $60,000, while Pep accepted 22.5% and received 36500 The referee and third judge for the evening was Ray Miller, and the other two judges were Frank Forbes and Arthur Adala. It was reported that after referee Ray Miller called Pep and Sadler to the centre of the ring for instructions, he said, good evening, gentlemen. Something not expected for the times. And you could say he jinxed it as we explain how this fight went down. And I'm going to jump into round one. And the first round went how many predicted. Sadler connected early with a left hook to the chin and Pep felt those blows however he shook them off and uh, dominated with his boxing skills as he had done in the other fights using his lefts and rights to the head and body a frustrated Sadler was actually warned for holding and hitting on the break rounds two to four and early in the second Sadler landed a left hook that cut open Pep's right eyelid before a body shot drove Pep to his knees for the count of eight as described by the press, he, as in Pep, rallied superbly and rocked Sandy with a big right while Pot shotting him with 13 unanswered blows. The boxer versus the puncher could not have been any more evident when explaining these two fighters' boxing styles, but the first two rounds also epitomised that. After the second round, the boxing match turned into what Nat Fleischer called a disgraceful brawl, and what James Dawson reported, for roughness, Disregard the ring rules and ethics and wild fighting, they surpassed anything seen in their three previous meetings of these bitter ring rivals. Any resemblance to the accepted theory of boxing as a fair stand-up exhibition of skill between two perfectly trained, well-matched sportsmanlike individuals was purely coincidental. The United Press agreed with both, writing that virtually every rule in the Boxing Commission's book was violated by the two bitter feudists. To put it into perspective, it turned into a street fight. 
Millie became so angry with both fighters' behaviour that he warned them in every round and practically every time they broke. So rounds five to nine and nothing more than dirty tactics persisted while everyone watched on in just pure disbelief. Sadler was wrestled to the canvas in the fifth and then both fighters hit the deck after clinching in the sixth. One reporter explained that both wound up on the pad in a death lock. I mean, <laughs> it must be just, it sounds like a UFC fight. Although both were guilty of dirty play, it was actually Pep that was penalised with unnecessary roughness in the seventh. Referee Miller actually got tangled up with the fighters while trying to separate them and went down in, and as he went down, there's a, a chorus of laughter and jeers. It just turned into a mess. The Beaver Valley Times wrote that the two desperately bitter little men clinched, grappled, butted, healed with the glove laces, held and hit, punched below the belt and thumbed the eyes. Sadler was wrestled down once more in the eighth and there ensued a mid exhibition of strangling. <laughs> At the end of the night, Fran Dawson explained that Pep was all in slumped forward on his stall he seemed to be looking for someone or something to pump fresh oxygen into his lungs and fresh ambition into his heart it was mayhem in pep's corner when miller gave him another warning after listening to what the referee had to say pep decided to remain seated telling miller that he could not continue because my right eye was killing me someone in his corner tried to convince him to go back out for the 10th but he was ignored by Miller, who indicated that the fight was over, and then ordered Dr. Vincent Nardellio to examine Pep. He was complaining that his right eye was bothering him, but the physician said that he was alright to continue, though indisposed. You can see the images of the eye, and today, it would have been stopped nine times out of ten. Pep was the only one who disagreed, and he pulled out of the fight by his own accord because of severe eye pains. His eye was swollen shut by that point, and in a horrible state. Pep would later say, I couldn't see at all. You can't fight with one eye, not against Sandy Sadler, and not in a fight like that. It was over. Mike Casey agreed with Pep when he wrote, One of the all-time great shiners, an absolute peach of a black eye that would have stopped King Kong in his tracks. As the bell had not rung for the 10th round, it was awarded as a technical knockout in the 9th round. Dawson summarised what he had witnessed, and he said, for a world championship battle, it was a sorry spectacle. Both fighters were guilty of the collar and elbow rough and tumble style of fighting made famous on the waterfront. The scores before Pep decided to call it a night read. Ray Miller had Pep ahead 5-4 to four on rounds and 10-6 to six on points. Judge Frank Forbes had Sadler in front 5-4 to four on rounds and 7-5 to five on points. And Judge Arthur Adala had it 4-4-1 four, four and one on rounds but he favoured Pep 8-6 on points. The Associated Press and the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette had scored the fight a draw, and the United Press had Pep ahead. Well, in the changing room, Pep was uh, apparently mad at everyone. He said, I had to fight the other guy, the referee, and City Hall, whatever that meant. Sadler, who had managed to hold on to his world title, said, I figured to fight cleanly and started to do so but Pep started it. He was healing, thumbing, stepping on my toes and wrestling all night. He kept standing on my toe. It hurt like hell and I yelled at him to stop. What did he do? He kept on doing it throughout the rest of the fight. Dawson said, referee Miller would have been justified in tossing both out of the ring. The press coverage after had nothing to do with Sadler's win, just the disbelief at what had happened, especially when considering the talent of both these fighters. The new chairman of the State Athletic Commission was Robert K. Christenberry, and he said those boys don't like each other, just quite simply as that. Boxing writer Don Stradley said anything resembling boxing that may have occurred during this bout was purely coincidental. Pep and Sadler had already met three times but their distinction for being a dirty duo came from the fourth bout a brawl highlighted by headlocks hammer locks and lots of old-fashioned schoolyard tripping maybe these two featherweight legends were inspired by all the pro wrestling that was on the tv in those days 
Pep even tried to trip Sadler from behind while riding him piggy bank. Pep, who had suffered a horrible cut over his right eye, finally got it on his stall in the ninth round. The New York State Athletic Commission revoked Pep's license and actually suspended Sadler after this fight. Al Abrams, sports editor for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, called the fight nine rounds of the worst exhibition of unsportsmanlike conduct ever seen in a bout anywhere. Aprons continued and said Pep and Sadler wrestled each other to the canvas several times and threw the ropes on three different occasions. Hitting on the break was nothing by comparison with the healing, open glove rubbing, holding and hitting and even hitting when a fighter's back was turned. In the December 1951 issue of The Ring, editor and publisher Nat Fleischer called this an extremely dirty fight. And this is what else he wrote. Wrestling healing, eye gouging, tripping, thumbing, in fact every dirty trick known to the old timers. Referee Ray Miller let the bout get out of hand. The pattern of the contest never varied. Pep wouldn't make a fight of it and Sandy couldn't. Pep too frequently backed around the ring and Sadler just as often missed as he kept boring in trying to corner his man. And when he did, the rowdy tactics got underway and ended only when either both were sprawled on the canvas still wrestling in each other, or the referee was outside the ring just trying to pull the boys apart, or both fighters and official were entangled in a pretzel formation on the ring floor. Rocky Marciano, whose own roughhouse tactics were legendary, called the contest the roughest, dirtiest fight I have ever seen. Due to one of the dirtiest fights in boxing history, both men were investigated by the New York State Athletic Commission, Kristen Berry examined the fight by collecting reports from boxing officials and held an open hearing with both fighters in October. On the same day, Kristen Berry asked for reports from the officials. Sadler reported at the Army's pre-induction centre for his physical examination and was ordered to report to Fort J for a further check, preliminary to being recalled for service. Whatever the outcome of the investigation... It would seem like neither would suffer much harm, with Sadler calling for duty and Pep disclosing that he was debating on retirement. Well, the New York State Athletic Commission held their open hearing, which was led by Kristen Berry informing both fighters, you violated every rule in the book. It is the unanimous opinion that the punishment be affixed. Sandy Sadler's licence was suspended for 60 days. Willie Pep's for life although it was subsequently reinstated within two years. The two fighters were not the only ones reprimanded. Charlie Johnston was actually penalised for interfering with Dr. Nardiello and received a 33-day suspension and a fine of $100. Johnston said that I shouldn't have done it and I'm sorry. But he did defend his fighter, Sadler, saying that it was a drastic decision against my boy. He blamed Pep for all the dirty tactics and said that Sadler was never suspended and never questioned about his behaviour in the ring. It was in the, ensuring, in the ensuring uproar, referee Miller testified that the disgraceful conduct of Pep, who was of Italian stock and Sadler West Indian, I don't know why he says that, but had made him fear a race riot. There you go. Pep said, I didn't try to destroy the reputation of it is my livelihood and I want to continue boxing. When asked why he didn't listen to the referee, Millie replied that it seemed there was, was no referee in his fight. He was getting in too late for breakups. The only way I could get away from Sadler was to wrestle him. He was holding me by the head, banging away at my eyes. Sadler remarked innocently, I thought it was a clay fight. <laughs> Kristen Berry asked, you don't think the warnings to the, of the referee were justified and Sadler just quickly replied no. Sadler's suspension was the full 60 days and he was able to continue with his career. Pep had an application for his license to be reinstated on March 27, 1952 but it was finally restored one year later, March the 27th 1953, a full 17 months after being revoked. He apologised to the commission in person he said I'm sorry over the way I acted I won't lose my head again. In his book, Friday's Heroes, Willie Pep said, Sand is just rough and tough and not a dirty fighter as people think. He's almost 5 foot 10 inch frame, tremendous reach and the punching power of a welterweight sometimes had the 5 foot 5 inch opponent tangling himself to get inside on Sandy. 
the Ring named the fourth and final battle, the sixth dirtiest fight of all time in their December 1997 issue, Bert Sugar and Teddy Atlas disagree on who the number one featherweight of all time is. Bert had Willie Pep as the number one, and Atlas had Sadler. So now we're going to move in to the aftermath of this wonderful tale. And we're going to talk firstly a little bit about Sandy Sadler's career. Now, Sadler was unable to capitalise fully on his third victory over Pep in four fights, as his career was then interrupted by a three-year stint in the army. He did return to recapture the nine-stone crown by outpointing Teddy Davis on February 25th, 1955. Having stopped Flash El Orde in San Francisco on January 18th, 1956, Sadler was still world champion the following year when he was forced to retire because of an eye injury suffered while travelling as a passenger in a taxi that crashed. Having been warned that he risked blindness, Sadler closed a 12-year career in which he lost only 16 times with two draws. Sadler was bitter in later years when he reflected on the acclaim that followed Willie Pep, but had eluded him. He believed racism played a part and he said, they talk about him being one of the greatest fighters that ever lived, but I beat him three times in four meetings. Sadler, who went on to train world heavyweight champion George Foreman in the 1970s, with Foreman describing Sadler as a boxer. Sandy was vicious. There is no other word to describe him in the ring. He would try to really put that into me. When he was in the ring, he knew nothing about retreat. Everything was about get him, get him, get him. Sadler ended his feud with Pep by boxing a one-round exhibition contest with his great rival in 1973. By then, Sadler was 47 and Pep 50, but Sadler still took offence over the fact that Pep was introduced first. So Sandy Sadler was elected into the Boxing Hall of Fame in 1990, but then he suffered a savage beating in a street robbery. Now, the New York Times reported that the punks knocked off Sadler's glasses, cut off his pants with a box cutter, took his money and stomped him. Cops found him wandering the streets half naked without any identification. When the cops asked what happened, all he could say, I was the featherweight champion of the world. I'm Sandy Sadler. The police found his pants in a nearby garbage can. In his pocket, there was a business card from Ring 8, the New York chapter for Veteran Boxers Association. So that's whom they called. And it was uh, Tony Mazzarella who worked for Ring 8 in 2000. And he mentioned that the last time he saw Sandy, he said it was in Atlantic City three years ago. He was in bad shape. A fan asked him for an autograph and he just drew a line. After that, we kept the fans away. Not long later, he developed Alzheimer's disease. His final years were spent at a nursing care center in the Bronx, where he died at the age of 75 on September the 18th, 2001. He had the most knockouts of any featherweight and ranks in the top 10 knockout artists of all time for all divisions. He ended his amazing career with a record of 145 wins, 104 knockouts and only 16 defeats. The only stoppage loss was that second pro fight and two draws. In an interview with Peter Heller, interesting what he says here, but this is what Sandy says. He says, it's like they say, if you're white, you're right. If you're black, get back. That's all there is to it. I'll lay my cards on the table. It's just plain old prejudice. The black man in this country, we have to do twice as hard as the white man to gain anything. And when we get it, for Christ's sake, they don't give him the recognition a man should get. And that's the whole thing in a nutshell. Just plain old prejudice. This country's built on this sort of stuff. And, you know, you got to make him right. That era is bang on. Sandy Sadler then went on to say, I'm not angry at Pep at all. I'm angry at these other people who's pushing this thing, Pep and I. Are great friends. So now we're going to talk a little bit about Willie Pep's career afterwards and he did fight on until 1959 and then retired and then returned in 1965 at the age of 42. He fought another 71 fights after the fourth saddle about when in 64 knocking out 13 and losing just seven. Although he never recaptured or fought for a world title again he ended his career with an unbelievable record of 229 wins, 65 by way of knockout, just 11 losses and one draw. 
Pep remained active in boxing after hanging up his gloves, serving as an inspector and referee. In 1977, Pep was elected to the National Italian American Sports Hall of Fame. He was inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame in its inaugural year of 1990 and ranked six on Ring Magazine's list of the 80 best fighters of the last 80 years in 2002. In March 2006, Pep resided at a nursing home in Connecticut, diagnosed with dementia pugilistica, before his death on November 23rd, 2006. Pep was named the third greatest fighter of all time by Burt Sugar, ranked fifth on ESPN's 50 Greatest Boxers of All Time list in 2007, and voted as the greatest featherweight ever by the Houston Boxing Hall of Fame in 2014, a voting body composed totally of current and former fighters. In 2011, the city of Middletown, Connecticut constructed the Willie Pep Skate Park named in his honour. In 2021, a feature film based on Pep's life went into production in Hartford, Connecticut, directed by Robert Colonde, and the film stars James Medio as Willie Pep. Lawrence Gillard Jr. portrays Sandy Sadler and the folks and focuses primarily on his 1965 comeback. So we're going to end with a couple of quotes from Willie Pep. So I've got a couple to run through and Johnson's got a couple to run through. So these are Willie Pep quotes, which we thought were great to add in just at the end. So the first one, as he says, is I made $1.3 million in boxing and I lost $1.4 million. And he also says, there are three things that go on a fighter. First, your reflexes, then your chin, then your friends. He also said that, who was the best person I ever fought? My third ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, uh, my fighting style is, he who hits and runs away lives to fight another day. And that's what I did for 29 years. I tried to hit and get away, and I did. I got away with it. Brilliant little lines there from the legendary Willie Pep. Yep, great, great lines from Willie Pepper and a great tale overall. Really thoroughly enjoyed putting this episode together. I've enjoyed delivering the story, some brilliant, brilliant moments in these fights between one another. And I think it's just testament to how good both of these fighters were. And you, I think you have to feel a little bit for Sandy Sadler in this whole tale because Willie Pep, by many, is considered one of the greatest of all time. Whereas Sandy Sadler, even though many boxing historians do figure him in that sense, I think you sort of average fan who sort of looks at these lists, they don't even realise that Sandy Sadler beats Willie Pep three times over out of four fights. And I think that's a huge statistic that people forget about when looking at all these top 10s and top 20s and top 50s and, and whatever it may be. I think the, the difference between the two is that Willie Pep had how many fights? absolutely unbelievable amount of fights that he took part in I think is what helps the matter even more is because he took part in so many fights and won so many fights and given the amount that he won in, in terms of how many he lost you know it isn't a bad ratio whatsoever to, to say that you've won so many fights so I think people do look at Willie Peppers as, as the greater of the two fighters but Sandy Sadler for me comes out of this with the sort of renewed this renewed respect not like i didn't have it for what he'd achieved in his career before but knowing more of the stories surrounding these fights and this time and what he'd achieved in his career i come out of it thinking that you know sandy sadler is actually one of the greatest fighters of all time and just doesn't get looked at in as high regard as some of the others over the decades oh absolutely mate i absolutely agree with you i think the problem was was the fact that he was as he described right at the end there is it was a, a race issue. You know, it took him so long to get his opportunity. And when he did take it, he took it with both hands. But, you know, for anyone to turn around and say, Willie Pepper is one of the greatest fighters of all times. I mean, it's difficult to, to say that he is. And when you look at that record, how long he went undefeated before he actually finally lost the fight and then went on another crazy run as well. I mean, people like make Floyd Mayweather this amazing fighter because he's 49 fights undefeated. I mean, he overshadows that by none, didn't he? I mean, you look at what he done. It's insane in two years, how many fights he had and then to go on to win that world title as well. But then you've got to look at, on the other perspective, Sandy Sadler, freeze, freakish size and power. I mean, I think, I don't think I've ever seen or heard of a featherweight 
knocking guys out that much. I mean, you look at the top hitters, they always tend to be sort of from the middle weight up. And then obviously the bigger hitters in the sort of light heavy cruiser heavyweight division. You never see a featherweight knocking people out. Literally, how many articles were there? One punch, 43 seconds, knocking guys out. Lit- weren't even just like stopping them. He was knocking them clean out off their feet. So, uh, I mean, it's insane. And then, as I said earlier, like the likes of Aguero and Hearns and Foster, you know, those tall guys look freakishly thin and tall, but yet I, I, I kind of, I, I love their style. It's a shame we can't get as much footage on Sandy. It's, it's out there. I mean, all these fights are out there. I think I think the first one, not so much. I think there's like gaps and stuff. There's one with Rocky. I think the full fight, Rocky Marciano sort of does a little show and they discuss it and stuff, but that was awful. That was awful. <laughs> I mean, by the sounds, it was actually quite funny, but I mean, Sadler's a legend, man. I think that's the one thing about this whole thing. I mean, we knew Willie was already and it was always intriguing because we always knew he beat him three times, Sandy, but you never quite understood why he wasn't as adored. And I think, you know, the fact that Teddy Atlas has him as the greatest ever featherweight, I mean, that says it all really, doesn't it as well? I mean, the fact that you, you just look at who he beat and even some of them defeats shown as well and draws, I bet they probably weren't even defeats and draws. They were too tight to call. He probably didn't get it because of his race. It's just a, sh- it's just a shame. I mean, another fighter, isn't it, Sean? And we do these fighters so often, the Langfords, you know, and the Joe Gans, and they just don't get as much rec- recognition. So hopefully this legendary night, we can blow the trumpet at Sandy Sadler because I know a lot of people already do it with Willie Pep. But going back to the actual fact, they're a great rivalry for three great fights and one absolute wrestling match, basically. <laughs> yeah, definitely was a wrestling match, a real no holds barred street fight, that full fight. <laughs> but let's be honest, it is it's been a great it's been a great tale, hasn't it? It's been great to learn more about both of the fighters, in particular more Sandy Sadler, learning more about the origins and where he came from. And you know, both of these fighters, as we said at the start, do make for good career profiles so in the future we will do career profiles on them because there are more stories to tell and this is why we've not put them into this episode because there are more stories out there to tell on both of these fighters for a future episode and we hope you've enjoyed this episode the tale of willie pep and sandy sadler if you have please make sure you let us know on social media at Legend Night Pod on Twitter or the BTR Boxing Podcast Network Facebook page. If you've watched it or listened to it on YouTube, drop a comment in the box below and let us know what you think about them. Is your debate there about who is the best featherweight of all time? Would you put Pep at number one or would you put Sadler at number one? Be interested to know what people's thoughts are on that. If you are a patron of this podcast and you've had early access and ad free version of this episode, I just want to say thanks because we really appreciate your support and if you're not a patron and you do want to check out what we do on our patreon membership service you can do that by checking us out at patreon.com forward slash btr boxing podcast network to see all the available extras that we do for the service to help get support from people like yourself helping us invest more into what we do and what we produce to provide high quality content all the time Well, that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening to the tale of Willie Pep and Sandy Sadler.